it seems somehow customary at the start of, of any new year for, for people to be asked what, what their hopes are, what their aspirations are for the coming 12 months. It may be on, on television, maybe some personality, a presenter or, or a sports person or something, something like that. And they want to know what, what they are looking to the future for. If we were to ask really just our friends, our neighbours, our families, or indeed ourselves, what our hopes are for 2021, I can't help but imagine that for many of us it, it will in some way revolve around the present pandemic that has not only gripped our land, but indeed has, has effectively gripped the whole world. Of course, in the closing weeks of 2020, there, there was great anticipation and excitement uh, over the, 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 the findings that the vaccines that had been developed were, were proved to be effective. Of course, that is itself a, a source of, of hope for the future. Yet, there are questions. Will we be able to roll out the vaccines effectively and in time in Scotland or the rest of the United Kingdom? What about the rest of the world? What, what about some of the world's poorer nations? What about lands that do not have the infrastructure that we have because as you would listen to some folks it it would seem very much that the vaccine is is their hope for 2021 now whether as a result of the vaccine or or other reasons there are many who would say well my hope for 2021 would be that perhaps these restrictions would be able to be relaxed and somehow life could come back to normality. When at the same time we, we, we hear plenty pundits telling us, forget normality, get used to the new normal, because things will not be the same as they were a year ago. Yet in my mind over these past weeks and months, the, the thought of, of these hopes has been, been very much uh, there in my thinking. And, and especially as I was thinking about what to share with you on, on this first large day of, of 2021, when for so many their hope is, is simply to have an alleviation of of our present problems that we certainly pray will, will indeed come to pass. But is that really our Christian hope? Is that as believers what should be our priority, our, our focus? Is that where we should find our peace in our hearts? Many of you will know, I'm sure, that when the scriptures speak of our hope, they are not simply expressing a longing in the sense that we might say, well, I hope these things will come to pass. No, instead they are expressing a certainty, a certainty that is based on who God is and what God has done for us. I could have read from a number of passages this morning, but the passage there in Hebrews chapter 6 is a helpful passage because it reminds us of the very foundation of our hope as believers being the Lord Jesus Christ, our great high priest. So this morning, I want us to, to take just a little bit of time to think about 
our hope. In my Bible, this passage, verse 13 to verse 20, is headed, The Certainty of God's Promise. Of course, it speaks of the promise that God made to, to Abraham. And in, in that Old Testament way of, of someone, as it were, affirming the veracity of their word by, by swearing a, a, an oath, the writer of the letter to the Hebrews says, when, when God made a promise to Abraham, there, there was no greater one by whom to swear. So he swore by himself. Surely I will bless you and multiply you. This was when God made a promise to Abraham. And indeed verse 15 says, And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. I wonder how good you are when it comes to patience. Even patience in things that we are trusting God for. Sometimes our patience slips. And I'm also thankful that the scriptures, when they, they speak of Abraham, they, they, they do not, as it were, highlight Abraham's failure, but instead simply remind us that Abraham did wait. He waited patiently. Why do I say I'm glad about that? Because, because patience wasn't Abraham's strong point. Remember, after all, that Abraham had gone to Hagar. After Sarah, his, his wife gave him Hagar. And she produced a child. But that was not the child of, of the promise. No. Ishmael, the father of the Arab nations, was not the child of, of the promise. But Abram did wait. And even in these verses, we're told he waited patiently. And he obtained the promise. Friends, the story of Abraham reminds us that when we, as it were, take the future into our own hands, so often it can go wrong. But if only we wait for God to fulfill his promise to us, then there is blessing. There's blessing. How easy even in our own lives to sometimes press ahead with second best. When if we would only wait upon the Lord and wait patiently for him, we would know his promise. Because you see, the first thing that I want us to know this morning, as we consider hope, is that we have a promised hope. Verse 13 of Hebrews 6 speaks of this promise. Verse 15 speaks of this promise. And in Titus chapter 1 verse 2 we read, In hope of eternal life which God who never lies promised before the ages began. So if you're taking notes this morning, first point, we have a promised hope. Whether here in Titus or in the verses we are read in Hebrews chapter 6. We have a God who has made a promise. And that promised hope, as Paul writes to Titus, is a hope of eternal life. Friends, this world is, is a transient thing. There's that lovely old hymn that says, When this passing world is done, and one day this passing world 
will be done. One day, should the Lord not return, your life will draw to an end. My life will draw to an end. But eternal life, that which is promised by the grace of God through faith in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that eternal life, that hope of eternal life, is something promised. Promised. So, verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 6 says, in which it is impossible for God to lie. So when God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, he's not lying. When God says, when you pass through the storm, pass through the flood, pass through the fire, I will be with you. He's not lying. When God says that even in the valley of the shadow of death, he will be with us. He is not lying. His promise is sure. And notice that the God who never lies, as Paul writes to Titus, made this promise before the ages began. Friends, God's eternal purposes are set out in eternity and experienced by us in time. Time is all we know. The passing of one day to the next of one week or month to the next, or even particularly this morning, the passing from one year into the next. We are bound by time. God is eternal. From before the ages began, God has been faithful. And friends, as we reflect upon that reality we can know that at this moment at this place at this point in time God's promised hope is secure for we have a God who cannot lie a promised hope in hope of eternal life. Friends, there are those within our fellowship who in these past 12 months have lost loved ones, taken from us in death. How hard, hard that is. Yet for those of us whose hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, there is that glorious hope that we read of indeed in, 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 in 1 Thessalonians where it says, Therefore we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Why are we able to have, as it were, this different form of grief, this grief that is not hopeless because of eternal life? The eternal life which Jesus himself promised he would give to his sheep. His sheep being those who would put their trust in him, who would believe in him, who would follow him. I give them eternal life, said Jesus, and no one can snatch them from my hand. And then should we somehow be given to imagine that perhaps Jesus hasn't got enough strength to hold on to us he says no one can pluck them from the father's hand i and the father are one dear friends facing even trials and fears in life let us never for one minute be caused to doubt that somehow god cannot hold on to us he can Neither is it a matter of asking, do we have the strength to hold on to him? Personally, we don't. 
But that's not the question. The question is not, do I have the strength to hold on to Christ? But does Christ have the strength to hold on to me? And oh yes, he does. He does. And we have this promised hope of eternal life. Purposed by God in eternity. Purchased by Christ on Calvary. And experienced by us in time. When God in his mercy and grace was pleased to change our hearts and cause us to put our hope and our faith and our trust in him for salvation, that all the glory would go to him. Oh, praise God for his amazing grace. But not only friends do we have a promised hope from the God who cannot lie, but we have a living hope because we have a God who cannot die. 1 Peter 1 verse 13 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You might be saying, oh, but Jesus died. Yes, but it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And he was raised from the dead, never more to die again. We have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But notice again what Peter says. He says, according to his great mercy. You know, we began the, this morning by thinking of God's steadfast love and his faithfulness. You know, the, the thought of God's steadfast love and, and his mercy are, are so closely interwoven, it's hard to separate them. His mercy toward us. He knows what we are, yet he loves us. In mercy, he has not treated us as our sins deserve. And in grace, he has blessed us with so much that we do not deserve. How good is God? According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. Friends, that's an important point for me to, to point out. That this living hope is only a living hope for those who have been born again. He caused us to be born again to a living hope. How does that work? Nicodemus came to Jesus as as, as the little children's chorus that I grew up singing in Sunday school says, Nicodemus came to Jesus one night long ago and the Saviour told him something everyone should know. And if you don't know what Jesus told Nicodemus, you'll find it in John chapter 3 and verse 16 and the verses leading up to verse 16. Because Jesus made clear to Nicodemus that if someone was to have a part in God's eternal kingdom, they would never have that through their natural birth. Everything that Nicodemus had been raised believing taught him that that was how you found your place in God's kingdom. And Jesus said, no, you must be born again. Not born physically, but spiritually, the new birth brought about God by God's great mercy and his grace to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christ is raised. Christ is alive, friends. Jumping back from 1 Peter back to our passage in Hebrews. What do we read there? 
we read in verse 19, we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. A hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. You know, friends, prior to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the cross, once a year the high priest would go behind the curtain in the temple and there he would offer sacrifices of atonement to atone for the sins of the people. And as he would be there behind that curtain, he would be moving constantly and having offered the sacrifice, he would come out from there. But our Lord and Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself on Calvary's cross, was the final and full atoning sacrifice for sin. He went through that curtain into the inner place, into the very presence of his God, his Father, into the very presence of his Father. And he has gone there on our behalf. He's there on our behalf. He is interceding for us. He is alive. He is exercising the ministry of the great high priest, the perfect, eternal high priest. Upon Calvary's cross he made full atonement for our sins. And even now he intercedes. You know, Spurgeon once said, if you could but hear Jesus in the next room praying for you, how much your faith would be strengthened. And even though you may not hear him in the next room, be assured that he is praying. He is praying. Christ is praying for us, interceding for us. And this living hope that is ours, that we have been born again into by God's mercy and grace, is ours through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He lives that we may live. He lives nevermore to die. Friend, we not only have a, a promised hope, we have a living hope. And a living hope in the one who even now in heaven is making intercession for us. Oh friends, there are times surely for each of us when we struggle when perhaps even doubts can come. Accusations, as it were, arise against us in our minds. Yet that lovely hymn that we sing from time to time before the throne of God above, I have a great high priest whose name is love. When Satan tempts me to despair, tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because my sinless Saviour died, my guilty soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Our living hope is in a saviour who continues to exercise his high priestly ministry. Having made full atonement for the sins of all his people, he sat down. And even now, he lives 
to intercede for us. But dear friends, not only do we have a promised hope and a living hope, we have a blessed hope, a blessed hope. Again in Titus, this time chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul writes that we are waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Not only do we have a hope that is promised to us, a hope that is living, we have a blessed hope that is founded in the fact that our Saviour is coming. He is coming again. Friends, it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It is not for us to know the time, but it is us for to live in the constant expectation of the return of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You know, the sad longing of people who today would follow the Jewish religion is that they long to one day go to Jerusalem. Each year as they celebrate the Passover, they say, Perhaps next year in Jerusalem. Friends, as believers, Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed for us. That feast has been fulfilled. And our expectation is not perhaps next year in Jerusalem. It is perhaps tomorrow Christ may come again. Christ may come again. Many would look at the times and say, surely the Lord's return might be near. And I understand why they would say that. Yet there have been grounds down through each and every decade, indeed every century, when people would look and say, surely the Lord's return might be near. God is not slow in keeping his promise. God is not slow. Instead, God is willing that men might come to him to Turn to him in repentance and faith and be saved. Yet, friends, there is no reason why it could not be tomorrow. When Christ shall come, or indeed should Christ call us to himself in death, what will our hope be? You know, friends, that will be a day of great reckoning. I remember hearing one person put it this way, or reading reading one person put it this way. The death for the believer is the confirmation of all his creeds. But for the sceptic, it is discovery immense and late. Friends, whether our earthly life draws to a close at some point, even in this next year, or whether indeed Christ should return, we will all stand before him. And what will our plea be on that day? What will our blessed hope be? Our blessed hope as believers is that not only will Christ return, but when we see him, we shall be like him. We shall be like him. Friends, the scriptures make clear that those who die without Christ enter a lost eternity. But for those who die in Christ, they enter into the joy of their Lord. But should that day come when we must, as it were, stand before God, what would our plea be? What would our hope be? Friends, not only for this life do we have a steadfast anchor in the Lord Jesus Christ, but in him, Christ, our living hope, we have a saviour. 
It's in his righteousness that we will stand. It's in Christ and him alone that we will be able to stand faultless before his throne. And live out the reality of the words of the hymn that says, On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking stand. Dressed in his righteousness alone. Oh, friends, oh, that we would, as it were, cast aside our, our filthy rags of our own imagined righteousness and instead trust in the reality that Christ has clothed us, that we may stand before his throne. Oh, friends, Christ's return is the blessed hope of the believer. May I ask you this morning, are you ready for that? Have you been born again into this living hope? Are you laying fast on the promised hope of a God who never lies? The living hope of a God who cannot die? And the blessed hope of a Saviour who is coming from heaven to take us to be with himself? Oh, friends, may it be that Christ is our hope in 2021, whatever the year may bring. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the promised hope that you have given us in Christ. The living hope that is ours in Christ. And the blessed hope of Christ's appearing in which we look forward. May we be those who long for his appearing. May we be those who by your grace have been made ready for his appearing. All of this we ask in Jesus' precious name. And for his sake. Amen. Friends, surely, after these scriptures that we have looked at this morning, there is no better hymn for us to finish our worship today with than my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. So join with me now as we sing it to the praise and glory of God. 